to be free, to live free, to have the weight of sin taken away from you. That is an exciting thing. Now, we've been looking in the book of Leviticus. We've been looking at the Old Testament, and we've seen these offerings. We've seen all the process that has to take place. It's really easy as you do that to lose sight of the fact of what God is trying to do in our lives to allow us to know what it is to be free. In Leviticus, God instructs the Israelites about what it means to be a holy people worshiping a holy God. Now, if your first instinct is say, Old Testament, not today. No, that's something each of us needs to get a hold of. As a born again believer, we need to understand we have a holy God and we're going to worship him. We're going to walk with him. We need to do it and we need to find out what does it exactly mean. Now, about two weeks ago, we began with a lesson that said the, we looked at the burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace offering. And those offerings were very symbolic. They were teaching the people of Israel lessons that you and I have a little better understanding today. For them, it was brand new concepts. So in one offering, what they learned was about being forgiven of their sin and building this relationship with Christ. And in another way, there's another offering that helped them to get some symbolism going, that helped them to be appreciative of what had happened, a way of not forgetting it, if you will, much in the same way that we have the Lord's Supper. We think of the broken body when we see the wafer or the bread, and we think of the shed blood when we take the grape juice. And then there's this final offering they did, which was really a time of fellowship. And that fellowship, we come together and we worship together, and we were reminded of the sacrifice of Christ. Oh, by the way, and then last week we had another teaching. Today's study will be on how to get right with God and stay right with God. Man learning to draw near to God. Please stay tuned. You may recall we had Jim Ingram who taught us the lesson that said getting right with God and how important it was to be staying right with God. You see, now that puts us in the position for this week's lesson, saying having our sins covered in order to approach a holy God. We're getting back to relationship, and I think that's very important to understand. You see, the whole thing God has been working towards from the time of the fall of Adam and Eve was to restore us, to bring us back. He wanted to take down the walls so that we knew what it was to be with him again. Many who might watch this video may have actually been alive at the time that the Berlin Wall went up. But many more of you watching this video have been alive to see the wall come down. You saw people, because of the dramatic changes that took place, they literally, with their own hands and shovels and picks and anything they could find, tore that wall down. They wanted their freedom restored. They wanted to know what it was to breathe free air once again. And in doing that act, they regained their freedom, but they also quickly learned it's a constant effort to keep the wall down. And that's really what's going on in our faith. That's what went on in the life of the Israelites and in your my life today. You see, God helped to bring the wall down with the promise of Messiah, and they saw that with the sacrificial offerings. He built relationships. He did that by, again, having them go through symbolism that allow them to see this is what is involved in keeping the wall down, building relationship with God, remembering he is holy, therefore we are to be holy, separated, a separated people. And we don't go into works and trying to keep our salvation. What we do is we spend our days making sure we're not picking up bricks of sin just to rebuild a wall because by keeping our sin life under control, forgiven, short sin accounts we sometimes call it, what we're doing is allowing the fellowship with God. Salvation already secure, set free is the word we'll use for this lesson, to be set free as we look at Leviticus 16, 1 through 10 and 29 through 31. So we begin with God's presence. His presence is sinless. You see, God is holy, as we just said. So he doesn't allow sin 
into his existence and he cannot tolerate sin. That means if we come before him, if we come before the throne of God, we do so having first gotten our hearts right with God. And then there's the element of man's problem, which is sin. We need forgiveness. We need the purging of our sin. It's bigger than us. It takes something more powerful than us. And that's why we have God's presence. We have our problem with sin. And finally, our propitiation. Fancy word, but here's what it means. It means that Jesus Christ died for us and we have our sins forgiven. In Christ, when we call on him, having confessed our sins, acknowledging it, and then acknowledging that he is our Savior, our Christ, and asking him to save us. So our third element in verses 29 through 31 is our propitiation for our sin. So let's begin then with God's presence, his sinless presence. And we do well to remember that always God is as serious about sin as he is about restoring us. It's not, well, let me put it this way. If you see God sitting up like a big bully just waiting to find you trip up and fail, just so he can knock you further down, you don't know God yet. You may have gotten salvation, but you haven't gotten relationship. You haven't fallen in love with God. That's the best way I can think to put it. He's already fallen in love with us. That's why he so loved us. He gave us his son for us. And we can have salvation without necessarily falling in love with him. The moment we do, we begin learning just how much he loves us, how hard he works at keeping that wall separated from us so we can fellowship with him and that's what we should work on as well. Aaron's son, well, they came down before God and with strange fire and they died. They were executed, if you will, because basically what happened, if you didn't connect it in the scripture, they operated their own ideas, their own strength. You see, God is very particular, meticulous about the forgiveness of sin. Consider this, his son died for us. If there are multiple ways of being forgiven, our eternal blessing, then why would he ever risk his son? Why would he ever allow him to be beaten and broken and put upon a cross to be crucified? If there were other ways, there is one way, and that is Jesus Christ. Aaron's son came up with different ways to do the offerings, different ways to try to go in before the holy presence of God. And in doing so, they were struck down because they had gone against the very instructions of a holy God. Now we pick up in Leviticus chapter 16, starting in verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, in fact, let me pause for a moment. Remember they went before him? The scripture refers to them as giving uh, this fire, this uh, strange fire. Here's something important to understand. People continue to offer strange fire today. Now they may not get struck dead, but I guarantee you that the message they're delivering is not sound. And there are people who could know Christ as Savior, be born again, who are missing the mark, because of strange fire. It was an important thing that happened and an important thing for us to watch out for. So after that happens, we need to be on the watch for the people who operate in their own strength. Anything we do, we bounce it against the word of God to make sure we're on sound doctrine, sound footing. Because God's word will guide us, direct us, give us understanding. We can do things that are, from our perspective, totally new, fresh and exciting but it's in harmony with God's teaching. You see, there's the difference. And so, as I said just a moment ago, the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they had offered before the Lord that strange fire, and then they died. And then in verse two, and the Lord said unto Moses, speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place, within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark that he die not. Oh, you see, he's being warned, just as the sons had been warned, you don't do certain things. And it's interesting that what they're being told now, what he is being instructed to let Aaron know, you're only gonna do this at a specific time. You don't just arbitrarily run in and dash in before the holy presence of God, and you don't do it haphazardly just the way you think up. We're about to see the very specific instructions in the way he approaches a holy God, that he die not. 
And the scripture says, for I will appear, this is God speaking again, for I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. So Moses is to warn Aaron not to enter into that holy place at the wrong time. And that's significant because you see there's only going to be once a year that this takes place. And the scripture, as we're looking into our problem of sin, in verses 3 through 10, verse 3, Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock of, for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on that holy linen cloak, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh. And let me pause for a moment. Now, oftentimes people read these passages and they hear of these two goats and there's an offering taking place and there'll be a sacrifice. What you need to understand is there's actually four goats, four goats taking place. These first two are a little different. These first two, it's like this. Aaron is going to make an offering for all the people. He is going to come into the very presence of God. He's going to make the sacrifice. But before he goes into that area, he needs to be a man of holiness. So we're about to learn what he does and the sacrifices that he makes to bring forgiveness into his own life and into the life of his family. Now think of it this way. You attend a church or an evangelistic meeting and you have a pastor gets up on the platform or an evangelist and they're going to preach the word of God with strength and with power, no strange fire. Do you want that person to be a man of integrity? Do you want that person to know what he's preaching about? Would it bother you if this person had no moral character at all, was gambling on the side, playing with the money that came in through the church for his own whims? That would be upsetting. That would be devastating to many people, and it would keep some people from ever coming into that church. You see, before you ever let somebody stand up on the platform and lead the body of Christ, that local church, they have to get their hearts right. It's more than just getting an education. They need to have a spiritual education that says, I need to be right before God before I ever step up before people. And that's what's happening in this passage. Aaron is going to make a sacrificial offering for the sins of the people to roll those sins forward for a year why a year? Because it's an imperfect offering. It will take someone who will come and live a life without sin, tempted even as we are, and live a life of holiness to make a sacrifice of blood that can, in fact, redeem. So this is going to be a blood sacrifice from an animal, and that can only move it forward a year by God's declaration. So, verse 4, He shall put on that holy linen coat, and he shall leave the linen breeches upon the flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with a linen mater shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Holy. Separated, right? So these garments are unique. He may have other clothing he'll wear in the ministry. He may have other garments he wears so people realize he's a priest that goes and conducts these elements of forgiveness. But when he does this, this unique offering happening once a year on a specific time, when that occurs, he washes fresh, he prepares himself, he wears a different garment that is purely white, and, and it's, it's simple in some respects, but there's nothing distracting about it. It has a purpose. It's holy and separate for this moment. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. Aaron cleanses himself. He separated these garments specifically for these purposes. And then the blood sacrifices are going to initially take place for his forgiveness of sins and for the forgiveness of the sins of his family. Verse 5, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock for the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. Again, you don't want somebody preaching to the people, telling them about salvation if their own lives have not been redeemed and cleansed. Aaron is cleansing his life and that of his family before he stands before God's people and goes into that place of holiness to roll forward the sins of the people. So that's what he's doing first. And verse 7, And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord and at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. 
So now this is another set. He's taken these two. They are prepared for this moment. They are the best they found. They brought them up to this moment. And Aaron actually cast lots upon the two goats. That's what verse 8 tells us. One for the Lord, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the what's called the scapegoat. And so it might have been that he had you know, a couple of stones, maybe one was darkened, one was lighter, and he picked them out that way. It might have been two straws, any number of things he might have done to cast and basically decide, uh, well, which is which? God, which one do you want me to use for which? You might call it chance. I believe it was divine guidance that they made this choice. And so he casts lots and he arrives on the one goat that'll be in the offering and the other one that's going to be the scapegoat. Verse 9. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. So in that moment, what he's doing, he's taking in there, this lamb is being sacrificed on the altar, there into the presence of God. The purpose for which is its confession. Remember, in salvation, we have repentance. We turn around, we face sin as what it is. We see it as God sees it. And in this act, that's what's taking place. The people are saying, yes, we have sinned, yes, we have not been a faithful people. And so in doing that, Aaron takes us in as that sin offering. Aaron sacrifices this one goat as a sin offering for the people. Verse 10, But the goat on which the lot fell to be on the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. You see, on this one, Aaron is going to lay his hands on the head of the goat. And as he does this, he's going to be symbolically moving the sins of the people onto that goat. You see, what's interesting as this is happening, there's a lot of lessons that God is teaching his people about what happens in the life of a believer as they are forgiven and how God views those sins that are being taken away, washed clean. Aaron lay the hands on the goats. He moves the sins of the people away from them onto the goat. Verse 21 and verse 22. Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the goat and confess over him all the iniquities, all the sin, everything that was not of faith between the people and God. That's what he's going to confess on behalf of the children of Israel in all their transgressions, in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man. Nothing in scripture is by accident, by the way. There's a reason he picked that little phrase, a fit man. Now, I might be all right to be an Aaron. I could probably do the sacrifice if that's what you needed. But my legs aren't going to let me take this lamb or this animal as far as he needs to go, okay? That's why you found the fit man. You find the guy who's in, in good physical health that he can go some distance. He's going to put it into the hand of a fit man who's going to take that animal into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let the goat in go in the wilderness. What's going on right there? You ever heard that little passage, or you've heard preachers get up and make the statement that our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west, that you've been born again, you've been cleansed, that you're a whole new life, your sins have been separated, they're like at the bottom of the ocean of the sea. We find all these expressions, both in scripture and, and in our own creativity, trying to explain it to people. That's what's happening here. Visually, God's people are looking and seeing, well, my sins have been placed on the head of this goat, and now he's got this big burly guy taking the goat and walking a great distance, so far away from the people that that goat is not going to find its way back to the people. When sins are forgiven, they are gone completely. They've been covered by the blood. They've been taken away not to be revisited again. It only happens once a year. That's as far as they could roll it forward. But the message was clear to the people. This cost something. It cost blood. And it's not to come back in our lives. It's gone from here. Why would we entertain sin again if all this happened just to get it out of the camp? It's not welcomed in the camp of God's people. You're part of a local church. You're a born-again believer. You know Jesus Christ as Savior. Don't bring sin back into the camp. If you've got that pet sin you've been working on, let go of it, let God forgive it, cleanse it, and send it away, and never entertain it again. If you supported it with, you know, places you went that weren't right, or something that in your life that was associated with it, get rid of it. You don't want sin in the camp. You don't want it infecting 
your home, your family, your friends, your church. The goat has to leave the building. It's that simple. God does not allow sin to abide in his presence. He doesn't want it abiding in the church. He doesn't want it abiding in your home or your life. That's why we have this thing that we've just been describing called a day of atonement. It highlights the weightiness, the seriousness of sin and how God is going to address it in the lives of his people. Set free the peace offering. Leviticus 16, verses 29 through 31. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, ye shall afflict your souls, and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country, or a stranger that sojourneth among you. It's a powerful little phrase in here, by the way. Think of it this way. It's Sunday, and you've had people from out of town suddenly come to visit. And, oh, we're here, we, we thought we'd take you all out for lunch today, and, and we're just going to have, you know, we're going to go brunch for somewhere. How about that? We'll go brunch instead. So let's all get out in the morning after we sleep in and have a nice breakfast place. Our treat. And you're sitting there thinking, they know that I'm a Christian. They know I'm involved in my local church. Don't, this is going to afflict your soul. Don't let somebody else in your own country or a stranger keep this from you. No. Let people understand, in my home, in our homes, we're believers. We're going to come and we're going to worship. And what he was learning there in Leviticus is when this time of forgiveness was taking place, nothing is more important than spending time with God in the presence of God and being forgiven and restored and made whole and clean again. Whether it's a stranger or somebody from your own country, whether it's family or somebody from out of town that suddenly comes in, maybe it's a secular person, that boss that says, There's, we, we got a project that's more important. You know, can you still worship? Can you find a place to worship to fill that gap? If you can't be there on Sunday morning, can you do something else? Maybe there's a worship on a Saturday night. Maybe there's a, another place of worship where you can spend time with God and God's people. You don't just stop because of some sojourner that comes into your life. You make this the priority, your relationship with Jesus Christ and with God the Father, the very Spirit of God that's indwelling you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all the sins that are before the Lord. Leviticus 16, verse 31, it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you. This day that we're going to set aside for healing, forgiveness, now, don't, we don't come together traditionally and worship on a Sabbath. That was a day for man. That was a day of rest. And that's what he's saying is that you're going to rest on this day and focus all of your attention on the forgiveness that God is doing in our lives. By the way, New Testament Christians, we come together and celebrate on the first day of the week, Sunday, for the simple reason we're celebrating the resurrection. And sometimes in doing that, we neglect to get rest on Saturday. It's like we're hustling to get everything done except resting, refreshing, and being ready to worship God. The two events have significance. And what we're learning in this verse in regard to being forgiven is it shall be a day that we rest and we set aside and will afflict our own souls. In other words, we're having self-reflection on the fact that we're being forgiven and why we had to be forgiven and by statute forever. This is something that the people will continue to do. This day of atonement the sin is so devastating that only the high priest can go and enter into that holy of holies and then only annually. But there will come a time when the very Son of God will make a redemption for our sins and we will be forgiven. Understand that. Know that sin had to be forgiven. It was a wall up, just like that wall in Berlin. It was a wall between our freedom in Christ, in God, the very Spirit of God to dwell in us with freedom. It had to be forgiven. Hebrews 9.22, almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. That's important to understand. That sin is forgiven is a powerful thing to understand. It's a reason that we come and we give thanks unto God that he has restored us. Are we making blood sacrifices anymore? No. Why? Because in the Old Testament they were illustrating, showing what had to be done, and blood did have to be shed, and it was rolled forward and rolled forward and rolled forward until a perfect offering came, born in Bethlehem, lived this life, and then gave his life for you and for me who call him Savior and Lord.
those sins, that blood that was shed for us is so powerful, so important. And I ask you to consider this. If we are a grateful people that appreciate the forgiveness of our sins, then don't we need to live life that way? Don't we need to let God know how much we love him, we value him, how important that is to us that we are forgiven? The passages we read in Leviticus, it's not just Old Testament law. It is, they are powerful illustrations of the forgiveness of God, the love of God that he has for you and me who name the name of Christ. And if you've never accepted him, by all means accept him as Savior and Lord and know what it is to have your sins forgiven. I trust that you will join us again, that you'll continue to watch, and that you'll understand that you really can be free in Christ, regardless of what anybody else says. We can be free in Jesus Christ. Thank you.